Okay. I want to talk about what I do when I'm setting up a campaign. Perfectly round cats. Yes. Um, isn't there a newer Star Wars system out? How is it? Why use Blades Hack instead? Um, well, so the uh, Scum and Villainy isn't actually a Star Wars game. It is, um, it's a bit more Firefly. I mean, I suppose you could do Star Wars, you think. It feels to me like, um, like Firefly or, yeah, that's the Star Wars is the fantasy flight game one, which has special dice, which I think that Anna won't like because Anna does not like special guy, special dice. Yeah, but uh, Scum and Villainy is more like Cowboy Bebop, Killjoys, Fireflies. Uh, you are a crew of people on a ship pulling heists, like leverage in space. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, so that means that there are two RPGs with the same name. Awkward. Uh, <laughs> um, and it looks like no, no. It's not a Star Wars book. It's um. It's uh, by Evil Hat Games, and are all RPGs about heists now? You know, in some ways, isn't even D&D &D about heists? Sneaking into the dungeon, getting rid of the traps, avoiding shooting arrow things, getting the treasure and then leaving with it? Uh, Scum and Villainy is, but there is also... There is also, no, but seriously, there is also a an RPG called Scum and Villainy that is not a Star Wars book. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. Quick, quick look, Scum and Villainy. Scum and Villainy, a Forge in the Dark role-playing game. Uh, it's about spaceship, so this is what it says. Uh, unwise deals, blaster fights, high adventure among the stars. Welcome to the world of Scum and Villainy. Scum and Villainy is a Forge in the Dark game about a spaceship crew trying to make ends meet under the iron-fisted rule of the galactic hegemony. Work with the members of your crew to thrive despite powerful criminal syndicates, warrantable families, dangerous aliens, and strange mystics. Explore the ruins of lost civilizations for fun and profit. Can your motley crew hold it together long enough to strike it big and ensure your fame across the sector? Scum and Villainy is a standalone RPG based on the Forge in the Dark game engine. In this book, you'll find a clear gameplay structure that puts the focus on the criminal undertakings of the crew. A session of play consists of a job followed by recovery, downtime projects, and advancement. Ship character sheets that allow for XP spends, upgrades, and leveling up alongside your characters. Crew advancement opportunities to reflect the change from a ragtag group barely flying in the black to a reputed crew that has built a name across the sector. Forge in the Dark has tools to help keep the focus on the action of the job rather than the extensive planning needed to make it happen. Character and ship types help create unique and interesting crew at light speed. May your ship fly true, and may your blasters never jam. Scum and villainy in a world. Um, <laughs> so, uh, is it a heist if you also murder the inhabitants? Pumpkin, that is a very good question. Uh... <laughs> I, I don't I don't know about that. Maybe if, if only there was some some kind of snap your name for the rating of tombs. Um, <laughs> I want to hug it and squeeze it and call it George. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, so apparently there isn't there there is the people in the dragon heist don't do the heist. There, it was, there was a past past heist in the in the past there was a heist. So this, uh, this is, um, I've not played Blades in the Dark, which everybody seems to love, um, but this is Scum and Villainy. Star Wars D20 page, Scum and Villainy, ostensibly a de facto splat book for the scoundrel class. Nonetheless, rules for everything non-force related were included. Equipment modding rules are highlight. Ooh, two games with the same name. So when you're playing through the breach correctly, instead of incorrectly like my group has been, the story is supposed to follow the destinies of the characters created by their tarot reading at Kerjen. Kerjen. Charjen. Kerjen. So that, I just am thinking, sorry, I know I'm just saying that word over and over again because I'm trying to figure out how I want to pronounce it. I've only, I only read the word, I've never said it out loud. Do I want to say Kerjen? Kerjen. Kerjen. But it kind of looks like Charjen. Carjan. Um, chair Carjan. 
Um, so each session spotlights a different step in a character's destiny. And so there are five sessions per character. Oh, that's really interesting, Krellin. So it's sort of a charge Kerjin, Kerjin. I always say charging. Like, I never say it out loud. And now, now I've got in my mind all the different ways to say this word. And it's, I'm going to get, I'm, my brain is going to get stuck in a loop. And now you're going to know that I'm an Android. Um, <laughs> this is, um, yeah. Oh, I need, to, I need to check out through the breach. I need to check it out. Because char is a word, so you say that word. You know, this reminds me of another word. It's pronounced jaif. Jaif is how it's pronounced. Um, there's another word. I'm going to write it down in chat so you can see it. Um, so there's a word that one uses to describe a film about a person. Um, like the Winston Churchill film. Uh, B-I-O-P-I-C. And I always pronounced it biopic. A biopic. But I recently learned that it should be pronounced biopic because je fais, because uh, it's, uh, it's a bio biographical picture, so a biopic. But I always pronounce it biopic, like Krellin, because it feels je fais, because uh, it, um, it feels more medical that way, which makes no sense. But I think the word you're looking for is boring. Is that how you pronounce it? Boring. So, um, Scum and Villainy is based off of Blades in the Dark, which is actually sort of, sort of inspired or tangentially sort of coming out of Powered by the Apocalypse. It's not exactly the same, but there are, there are, there's, there are remnants, right? So for example, it's based on playbooks. Uh, when you make, uh, it sounds French, je fais. If it's French, then you know it's cool. Um, so you have playbooks, right? There's like the mechanic, the pilot, the doctor, the mystic, the muscle, the rogue, and, um, so Baron Tour, to answer that question, narrative and crunchy are not opposed categories they're different categories because you can have a really narrative game that is super crunchy i think um burning wheel is pretty narrative but it's also pretty crunchy and you can have a game that is gamest and rules light so like i think of i think of uh yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um it's certainly more narrative but it is it does not seem it does not seem uncrunchy it doesn't seem super rules light it doesn't seem super crunchy. It's not like it's, you know, it's not AD and D one E, but there are fiddly bits that you can work on in there. And uh, yeah, Jer, I feel like that's about the way I would say it too. It's it's crunchier than Powered by the Apocalypse because ad it adds more systems to it. Where right? you have like a spaceship that you can have. Um, Crunch is opposed to fluff, but that's but note that's not a game design question. It's a supplement balance question. Except that we can also talk about whether or not games are are crunchy or not crunchy, crunchy, crunchy or creamy. Right? There's crunch versus fluff in a supplement. Like how many rules are in that supplement? Is it like mostly background information without rules, or is it very rules heavy? But a system can also be crunchy or or uh, creamy. See, no, but people use the word crunch to describe how many, how heavy a rules, uh, if it's a rules light game or rules heavy game, sometimes people will use the word crunchy also to mean rules heavy. So crunchy ends up being used in two different sort of conversations of stuff, like it can work in two different vectors. But crunchier than Powered by the Apocalypse, because it's also because it has like um, a ship system and it's got a whole thing with about like, what do you call it? Uh, sup, Shaquille Oatmeal? Uh, how rules oppressive a games is equals crunch in my mind. Um, rules oppressive or rules exciting, Baron Tor? Sup, Shaquille Oatmeal? How are you doing? We're talking RPGs right now. Um, but certainly less crunchy than Shadowrun. And they've got things, but it, clearly the crunch is sort of there for um, particular kinds of narrative effect. So, for example, you have an equipment load, which is light, medium, or heavy. 
and you pick what your load is. Um, crunchy and Nerve Exalted. Mm. Ooh, uh, I'm doing well. We just finished reading a really bad book, uh, which was great. And now we're talking about Scum and Villainy, the RPG. Um, yes, Crunchy and Narrative is Exalted. That is that is fair. Rules, or we can say rules heavy and narrative. Um, so for example, they have this thing where you can sort of pick uh, light, medium, or heavy a heavy load for your encumbrance, but you don't pick the items that you have with you before the uh, the action starts. I know, Shaquille O'Meal is the best name. It is so good. I love that name. It is such an excellent name. Uh, so you say, let's say I say I have, uh, so equipment sort of takes up either one box or two boxes. And if you do a, a light load, you get three boxes worth of equipment. A heavy load, a medium load is like five and then like a heavy load is seven and you don't pick the equipment what you do is you just play and then in the middle of the adventure if you're like oh no you don't have a definitive list of items you have a list of items that you could conceivably have but in the middle of the adventure if you say like oh you know what i really need a blaster and so you're like well out of my equipment i have a blaster so you just tick off those things and you're like and then that's now your equipment if you're like actually i need a blowtorch and that's on my my general equipment list i took that along with me so you basically um you say you've got basically Schrodinger's inventory, right? There are a number of things that you that could be your inventory, and you decide in the moment if you need it that that's the thing that you have. So that is um, how. So that's like sort of there for narrative purposes. So I think they try to do things that way. Um, there are a number of things about the rules that are meant to generate sort of excitement. Um, it also there's also they also work in cycles where you do a, a heist cycle and then a downtime cycle, and when you do the heist, I think it increases your your um, stress, and then when you're in your in your downtime, you will then indulge in your vices in order to reduce your stress, recover from stress. But indulging in your vices is going to get into trouble. Just don't keep a, just don't keep a cat in there. But I think you probably, mm-hmm, right, exactly. So you have, this, you have this list of items based on your playbook. And then also I think a general list of items that you can also always pull things in. So it seems like it's really made to, you know, to do heists, to try, it really feels sort of Cowboy Bebop, Killjoy's Firefly to me, is what it feels like as a, as a game. Um, in terms of mechanics, you, if you roll a six, you succeed and get bonuses. If you roll a four or five, that's basically like a hold. Like you, you either, you either get it with a small negative consequence or like, you know, it's sort of that middle thing. And then one through three is a failure and bad things happen to you. And that's always the same. Like that particular thing is always, ooh. Somebody's watching me, and I have no privacy. Whoa, I always feel that somebody's watching me. Tell me, is it just a dream? Big Daddy, Big Daddy Tykeem17, welcome into the foxhole. Thank you for the follow. Uh, you know, we are like 26 followers away from 500 and when we hit 500 we're going to do a stream in pig latin or in way e way uh it hey i've hundred fey it way oenge ute ude e way imstre in way igpe atenle um <laughs> so can you not adjust the die rolls you get a bigger pool so no not additive dies actually um you don't get additive dies. My understanding is that if you have if you have a you can have a maximum of a three in a skill, and so if you have a three, which is a maximum, you roll three dice. You just take the best die. So it's so my understanding is that it's not uh, it's not additive, and it's not exact. So it's a dice pool, but you're just trying to get the best single die possible. So you have a better chance of getting above a three if you roll more dice, and you pick. Yeah, it's like advantage. That's right. It's like advantage. 
and and I think that there are ways to sort of push a little bit here and there, uh, maybe to get a sort of get a bonus to be desperate. And what they do is, um, yeah, that's right. And what's interesting, I think this is sort of fascinating, is that there are three difficulty levels, um, normal, risky, and desperate, like sort of like av regular, risky, and desperate are the three difficulty levels. The numbers don't change, just the consequences of what happens. So if you get a failure on a normal roll, like you, it's not bad. Do you know what I mean? Like if you, if you, if you're doing a, if you're doing a, a normal situation, you make that roll and you fail, then like it's a little bit of a setback. It's not that bad. If you're doing a risky maneuver and you fail, then you might get injured. If you do a desperate maneuver and you fail, then it's really bad. So basically the, the die rolling is the same. It's just that the, the consequences for succeeding or failing will differ depending on if how difficult the roll is. So they don't change the numbers, they just change the outcomes. So that's kind of interesting, I think. Um, I've not read the whole book yet, I've just made the character, but I've got the sense. I'm going to be playing a, um, I'm playing the pilot, and I'm not going to be the captain. I'm the uh, sort of younger brother of the mechanic who is the captain, and I am sort of a shy, bookish pilot who is who loves to fly and race things so that's and I, i'm i'm excited to see how that character goes but this is what i want to talk about i was just reading um this is for little red dot stream baron tour and we're gonna it's gonna be four sessions the first two and the last two tuesdays of july so we're starting the first week of, week of July, Tuesday, I think 8 to 10. I think that's what it is. I think it's 8 to 10 Eastern, two hour, two hour, two hour, two hour slots. I'm pretty sure it's 8 to 10. I think that's what I wrote down. Um, and what else? Oh, so Little Red Dot's going to GM. She's amazing. We are, it's four sessions, two hours apiece. I think that's about right. I'm pretty sure that's right. And I think it'll it'll be fun. It'll be good. Some new people to play with. And I I think she's super cool as a GM, so I recommend it. And it'll just be a nice it'll be a nice summer a nice summer game. And I ordered a space pilot jacket so that I'll have some a little bit of cosplay for the for the game because who doesn't want a little bit of cosplay for the game? Side note, there are a bunch of international high school students in the building that I live in right now over the summer, uh, and they are loud. So if you hear the sounds of uh, high school students in the background, it is because uh, there are high school students in the background. You know, just a little bit of cosplay. I mean, I'm not a sewer. I took sewing in high school for one semester and I do not remember any of it. So like so just a little just a little cosplay. I got a new I got I got a I got some stuff that I'm excited about. Um uh prospector cosplay. Ooh, um just a a little thing between all of us secretly. There may be there may be a one shot of uh super duper where our characters come back to where we revisit our characters 10 years later uh so we may you may be able to see my prospector zeke hart one more time just dag nibbit uh just you know this summer there might be a little looks a little bit of a you know just just there just a happy happy moments um <laughs> so i'm excited but also exciting, and Rissa was there, because Rissa's here right now in chat. I uh, GM'd her, uh, Cthulhu Confidential, on Sunday. Uh, I think he still has 10 minutes left 10 years later. He just, he's going to be older than Dirt. Uh, dirt, yeah, it's the... Uh, and we we ran through that. I feel like Zeke's just not going to die. I feel like he's one of these people that like just never dies, and he just gets older and smaller and shorter, and just more, uh, like, uh, wrinkled. Uh, he's, he's rock solid. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, he takes his minerals. Um, 
<laughs> he doesn't tarnish. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we did we did Cthulhu Confidential on Sunday. We did a four-hour session. Uh, we spent a little time doing uh, tech setup. Yoda wasn't some weird species that is just what happens to humans you live to be known. That is true. Yoda was just a human being. That's what, like, that's it. And uh, Zeke is going to look more and more like Yoda as time goes on. <laughs> uh, so good. Um, so we did like a four hour session with like an hour of, of tech and whatnot. And then we're going to do Sunday. This Sunday, uh, Rissa and I are going to finish up uh, Fatal Frequency, which is Cthulhu Confidential adventure with vivian sinclair and uh which is what do we learn he's a bird he needs the toilet they always need the toilet that's true about birds that's true they just let it go whenever they whenever they feel like it birds um so i'm i'm thinking we'll probably finish up the adventure on this sunday and once that's done then i can go and uh start scheduling Cthulhu Confidential to stream online and I think it would be excellent to do it on in July if I can get the people to do it we will do a stream on my channel in July -da! okay so this is what I want to talk about I want to talk about something don't hate oh um so there's a song, by the way, because it says don't hate on there. Uh, there's a song uh, by these three drag queens. And uh, there's a line in the song that always tickles me. It's do not hate. Don't discriminate. Do not Ashley or Mary Kate. And that's the line. Uh, on In July, I have been reading too much Atlanta Nights. You read too much Atlanta Nights and all of a sudden words don't work properly <laughs> i think if i i think i need a lot more maybe i should have more ad adverbs in my descriptions as a gm uh, that would be perhaps very good i think mm. anyway i'm hoping we can get some cthulhu confidential in july because august is gonna be a little bit tricky i'm gonna miss a week i'm gonna miss some streaming for um gen con and i think i'm gonna be gone for uh, August. No, words still work properly. You just lose your ability to recognize that. That's probably true. <laughs> That's true. Um, I know I have to, I cannot work on, I cannot write anything until I cleanse my brain of Atlanta Nights because then nobody wants an academic paper that has been influenced by Atlanta Nights. Or maybe they do. Maybe they do. He said, staring through his lips. Um, <laughs> I'm going to stare at you through my lips. You don't know. Mm. So I was thinking about, um, I'm reading through the fate book and I'm not done yet. I'm almost, and I'm like on the last chapter. And then once it's done, uh, I thought I would talk to you a little bit about what I do when I'm working on sort of setting up a campaign with a new system that I, that I, that's new for me. Like I read the whole book, Mm -hmm. I usually take notes on it, and then I will usually make, uh, what I do after I've finished reading the book is I make characters. I usually make an example of two protagonists and two antagonists, so I make four characters that are a little bit different, maybe different kind of archetypes, maybe like a, a talky character and a fighty character, you know, something like this. And after I make the characters, then I run them through sample conflicts. So a social conflict, a sneaky kind of conflict, um, combat, and then I see what see what it's like to run it. Roll the dice, do the whole thing. I pretend to be each of the people to see how does this work? Does this work well? Does it not work well? And then I also go through uh, recovery. I go through XP advancement. Um, if I try to make sure, like I try to do challenges, like oh, what happens if they have to run and catch a moving train, or if they have to run and climb jump, like all the different kinds of challenges you'd get in a in an RPG. I tend to run through those just on my own to get a sense of did this work. What I'm trying to do is to get fluid so that when I'm actually running the game, I don't have to look up too much. I try to think of like what happens if they do this crazy thing what would happen then so like I try to pretend to be a player who wants to mess all the things up and see 
what I need to do to do that. And then I will also, because uh, Fade is a little bit funky in terms of how it does things a little bit, I'm going to probably uh, go through the book and sort of notice the big, a, a second time, and notice the things that they want me to pay attention to, like the difference between a chase, uh, a challenge, a conflict, right? And all the different styles they have going on, and then just run through them so that I get a sense of how to run things. And it's interesting because if it's a very crunchy system, I will usually run practice combats on my own before I run. Just even if it's a game a system I know pretty well, just to get fluid, right? Because in on game day, I really try not to have to look up a lot in the book. I mean, I will if I really have to, but I try not to. So I try to anticipate all of those needs and doing a lot of um, talking to myself. Uh, <laughs> uh, doing a lot of talking to myself ends up being very helpful. And I recommend that as a strategy. And I do that as part of the world building. So I like, go through the rules. I'll make characters, which helps me really sort of get those rules in. And then I'll do practice conflicts and challenges and then XP and just sort of get that sense, and then I'll start, then I can think, oh, you know what, I need to adjust the rules this way, use these, uh, sample, you know, use these options, not those, and then sort of rebuild that way. And that tends to be what I do, and I'm at the moment right now, and I often will, depending, make a cheat sheet for myself, if and boil down the things that I will need to know and play for the system. And, you know, even for a really rules light game, I will do that because sometimes rules light games don't play like you think they will play. Sometimes you think, oh, this is rules light, it's super easy, but then you find out, oh, wow, uh, this is super deadly, or people will not, hey, Shep Exo, uh, you are a, hello, lurky Shep, how are you doing? We're talking about some RPGs right now. Um, yeah, so I think I think that even rules light games, sometimes you need to actually run them to see if their dice, what the dice run like, if they run well, if they don't run well, because sometimes, sometimes games aren't designed well, or sometimes there are little pitfalls and traps that you need to know. And it, sometimes it's just about, for me, about a, a sort of a, an ease, a fluency in the system so that when I, I can just sort of move quickly, because you want that, right? As a, as a GM, I, I always try. Uh, yeah, rules like, oh, the GM decide this, GM, uh, uh. And sometimes, yeah. And I, and I will tell you, I find a cheat sheet is so important because some books are not well organized and you want it, and they do not have all the things that are important all in the same space. And so you need to sort of condense all of them into a little cheat sheet. I, you know what I did? I did, um, for GURPS, I did this thing. It was really wonderful. I made a flow chart, a combat flow chart, a combat and injury flow chart, which um, I need to make a new one. It was brilliant. It was just because there are a lot of different options for GURPS, and sometimes you can be really light and don't and don't not use them, but sometimes you want to use them. And so I just made this really beautiful flow chart where it was like person attacks. Here are all the things you need to think. Here's how it just goes through. And then after I GM for a while, I just didn't need to really look at it anymore. But it was a very nice little visual flow chart that I put in my own. Uh, oh, say hello to monkey. Hello monkey. Hey 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 monkey. Hey cat. Hey cat. There you go, monkey, for you. Um, combat, page 27, mounted combat, page 323. But why, book? Why? Yeah. Yeah. Why do they do that? I don't know why they do that. It is unclear to me. Um, <laughs> oh, monkey's, monkey's not impressed. <laughs> monkey's not impressed. Um, Anna Geeks, I have a question for you. I have a question for you. Um, what are you doing? What are you reading right now, book-wise? What RPG are you reading? And actually, what are all of y'all reading right now? I'm doing Fate and Scum Villainy at the moment, and I need to finish up Fate today or tomorrow so that I can move on. Uh, Oh, the latest, oh, oh, the new one, the new one. Uh, how are you liking it? I have it on my hard drive, but I've not had a chance to read it yet. 
uh, how are you feeling about it? I mean, I know people who love Savage Worlds, love it, love it. Ah, uh, uh, it's the best bet you have for a Potterverse system. Huh. Levi, what, what game system are you doing prep for? I'd be reading through the breach if there were fewer streams today. I, Krellen, why am I so, I'm so terrible to you. I'm so terrible. I'm sorry. Oh, hey, I didn't show you this. Uh, you know how I showed you that I have this new um, Spire book, right? That I kickstarted that came in a source book for it. Right, I told you that, but I didn't show you what else came with it that I got. Carnival based heist in 5e D&D. Oh, Levi, I'm sorry you cannot convince other people to try their systems. That's the worst. Um, COC, oh, 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 oh. I need to read the Savage Worlds. A car thing intrigues me. Yeah, I'm super, uh, wait, wait, what did I do? What did I do? What did I start? I didn't even do it. I didn't even do it. Um, Call of Cthulhu 7th edition, yeah. Also something I picked up on free RPG day. Yeah, I'm really excited about, um, I'm really intrigued by 7th edition. It looks decent. It's interesting, reminiscent of some other systems I've played that were terrible, but only in that it takes like the one redeeming feature and uses that as a part of the system. Mm. Oh, a friend of mine is excited about Exalted Third Edition, and I just I was um I was having a conversation with I was over playing Overcooked Two with a friend who explained to me all of uh for th you're welcome, but for. For what? Oh, for 7e, right? Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, hey, look, so Spire comes with uh, a newspaper. Uh, like it came with a newspaper, right? The Kickstarter? Look at that. And then also uh, there's some old newspaper bits. Eavesdrop, Vera glass on glass, steals up to the window panes of the lofty. And some, there's some corsets, quality corsets. Uh, and some little clue stuff, right? So I do love, I do love cool, cool props. I love cool props. Yo, dog, we heard you like to read, so we include a newspaper and RPG so you could read while you read. Yeah. Hey, there's a game that I really, really like. Uh, a Neo is here, and she likes it as well. Although not everybody likes it, but I like it. Have you um, ever played... It's a, it's a board game? Except there's no board. Um, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective? It's really good. Uh, I really like it. It's um, Sherlock Holmes presents you with a case and you have a map of London and different locations that you can go to. And you're, you're presented with like, this person was at this place, this happened, this is, how, this is all that you know about the murder. And your job as a team is to decide where you want to go to investigate. And each location is a turn. And you need to try to figure out like who did it, what their motive was, how they did it, those things you need to figure out as you do. And in as few steps as possible, right? In as few steps as possible. And the game comes with a map. It comes with a booklet with, um, with for each case has a booklet, which has information for each location possible. And then there's also um, newspapers from different dates. And so you can read through the newspapers um, to see if there are any clues in there. And, um, the thing about Sherlock Holmes that you're trying to beat Sherlock Holmes's speed, right? Like Sherlock Holmes, you don't know how fast he would get through the case, but maybe he could get through the case in like six turns. And how many, how many, uh, how fast can you get through? But you also want to get as much information as possible because at the end of the case, when you're finished, they're, they're, you're going to be presented with a couple of questions. Usually, who did it? Like, there's usually um, four main questions and then four side questions. Who did it? How they did it? There some, But you don't know what all the questions are they're going to ask you. They might ask you something like, where did so-and-so escape to after they left? Or you don't know. And, or who was so-and-so's brother? Like, I can solve this case in two turns. And 
so you want to try to gather as much information and be good as possible but you also don't want to take up too much time because for every turn you take after his his par you lose points uh it's really fun if you like that sort of a thing it's a lot of deduction solve that case krellen you know that t you know that game show dang that game show for those of you who are not normal aged like we are uh there was a game show back in the 70s called name that tune it might have might have drifted into the 80s where uh, people would try to name a tune and they would get a certain number of notes uh, and uh, you know I can name that tune in 15 notes but then the two different contestants would bid against each other lower like well I can name it in five notes well I can name that tune in four notes and then uh, somebody would say okay well go ahead and name that tune and then you know you get your three notes to try to name the tune and uh, sometimes people are like you they get one note and you're like Ms. Sue, you remember the show? Like, what is that? Name that tune. Bah. And you're like, mm, somewhere over the rainbow. Yes. And you're like, I'm like, how did they know that? Like, how did you know? Ugh. That was, that was insane. But why was, we were on a, we were on a thing. Um, oh, that's true. They did also get a clue. That is fair. That is, that is correct. They also did get a clue. And of course it wasn't, it wasn't, it was like, just like a piano note. So it wasn't like you had orchestration to help you out. Hmm. Um, Call of Cthulhu 7th edition, Savage, Savage Worlds, uh, Through the Breach, Exalted, oh, that's what I was saying. The same sometimes on Wheel of Fortune. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I enjoyed that show. Um, so Exalted. So here's the thing. I never understood. Yeah, this song was the top of the charts in the summer of 1962. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never really understood Exalted. I didn't really understand the setting because nobody explained it to me. And I was like, I don't understand what's happening. I was watching some Exalted and I was like, I don't know what's going on. I was like, I think you're gods. I don't know. But then this friend of mine explained the whole thing to me. And I was like, oh, now I understand what this game is about. But nobody had explained it to me up until that moment. Uh... I feel like Exalted could use a better elevator pitch, or maybe somebody could come up with a good elevator pitch for Exalted, because nobody gave me an elevator pitch, and I never got it until just recently. <laughs> Anna says, I produced an Exalted show, and I barely have any idea what it's about. That is fair. Oh, and another... Um, TTB, by the way, the Oxford Method and Oxford University is not the English Oxford, it's the Mississippi Oxford. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Um, Exalted could use a grumble grumble. Uh, so it needs a good elevator pitch. Uh, <laughs> hi, and Exalted is crazy. Oh, through the breach. Oh, 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 that's interesting. Thank you. Huh. Yeah, so I was I was given an explanation and now I'm trying to figure out the elevator. See, but that's not a but that's not a good elevator pitch because no one's gonna understand what's happening because the, the thing is it needs a lot more than an elevator pitch. Ole Miss is the top magical school in the world. Oh. Huh. Oh that's interesting. Huh. Huh. Yeah, so like Wushu Sorcery didn't actually do it because I was like, I don't know what these people are talking about. I don't know what is happening. Um, and this friend of mine explained it thusly, um, that there is a world that had um, a bunch of different... Uh, well, you know, it's interesting because it's it seems to me, having listened to this pitch, the story of the history, that it's it's not just... Uh, Chinese mythology. It's also ancient Greek mythology. That like there's a bunch of different. Um... Oh, you're also just placing it in modern Earth. Ah, yeah. No, I was I was explaining the setting, and then I was like, oh, okay. I keep biting my tongue because professional. But suffice to say, their marketing team could use some updates. I think that is fair. Uh, is. This, yeah, so in a world. So yeah, the I keep reading more Pendragon stuff, 
and thinking it could be very Game of Thrones. Oh, that could be good. You know, so what I was explaining of Exalted, because this is a person who's like, I don't know what is happening, is that it's a kind of an interesting mix of a bunch of different mythologies. No Peach Streets in Exalted, and that is a shame. That is a shame. That there were these gods, which I would sort of liken to the Titans, if you know your Greek mythology, who created a, a younger a younger generation of gods who we could think of as the Olympians. Um, and But when they created these, they're not called the Olympians, but I don't know what they were called. When they created the Olympians, they created them so that they could not work against them. So the Olympians, they're not called the Olympians, created the Exalted, which are basically demigods. Um, and those demigods, the, the solar exalted are like the big demigods are like the big ones. Um, there might even be a peach tree exalted. It probably has its own God. Um, and that those solar exalted, the most powerful and most biggest ones, big, big ones overthrew the Titans. Mm -hmm. And then they, oh, so many RPG companies need editing and marketing teams. It's crazy. Editing teams also play testing. I don't even, oh my goodness. So then, uh, <laughs> holy shit, man, you moisturize well. What type of moisturizer do you use? Um, I would say that what it is is I'm sitting underneath really hot lights. I don't even think it's moisturizing. I just think it's the hot lights that I'm currently sitting under. And uh, I'm in the Northeast where it's also a little bit hot and humid. So I just think of it as humidity at the moment. But the profit margin is so narrow that it's a, no, no, don't even worry about it. <laughs> don't even worry about it, Essa. Uh, it's, you know, when you're just sitting in like really humid weather and you're like, why is this my life right now? That's, <laughs> that is my life. I'm like, why? Why is it so humid? Uh, hot, hot lights of these hot Atlanta nights. Yeah, but you know, the thing is, yeah, if you, if you don't have bad editing, it's not good. And sometimes, yeah, unfortunately, I'm from the UK, so no chance of that. Oh, no. Uh, UK. Yeah. Um, you know what they say about the UK, that it's cold and rainy all the time? But I'm sure that there's some times where it's not cold and rainy. Maybe. Um, but, oh, you know what, though, Asa dude? I actually was just given some lotion from a friend of mine that um, I use when I start drying out because sometimes I do need it. And it is a French, it's a French, uh, a French lotion that I can tell you what it is. Actually, I can tell you what it is because I, it's, it's really good. I recommend it. Um, Exalted and Sign are both systems I'm very interested in trying out at some time as well as something superhero based and Cthulhu investigation of some time. Oh, so many recommendations. Um, the main thing I remember about Exalted and uh, are how their marketing guy came in and gave us a hard time for not being in the Exalted category. <sighs> Somebody's watching me and I have no privacy. Whoa, I always feel that somebody's watching me. Tell me, is it just a dream? Uh, I cut it off right there, but then just gotten to goodness. Uh, thank you for the follow, Essa. Um, we are on our way towards a, a stream in Pig Latin when we hit 500 followers, because who does not want to do that? I Don't even ask me. Don't even ask. Uh, <laughs> but wait a minute. I thought, Anna Geeks, I thought there wasn't an exalted category at the time. That's so weird. They were watching me with their lips. Um, oh, so then like these Solar, which are like the big demigods, they rule everything, but then they kind of get oppressive and then they're overthrown. Um, and then <laughs> you're like, I don't want to do that, but I'll be here anyway. But Krillin, they're going to be subtitles. They'll be subtitles. And so then apparently the the big Solar, the Solar Exalted are overthrown. They go go missing. Nobody knows where they are. Mm, they're taking their, they're like imprisoned and dragon exalted or whatever they're called are now running everything. And the game starts when the empress of the dragon empire goes missing and solar exalted starts showing up again. And in the base book, you play solar exalted who just start showing up again for the first time. So that's, oh, oh, that's interesting. 
Huh. Yeah, I think it's really hard. Um, I think it's really hard to deal with the sort of messiness of categories. It's, it's, yeah. Hey, could you give me one second? I want to tell, I want to tell Asa what this, what this lotion is. Hold on. I'll be right back. One second. It'll take me like 45 seconds. One second. I'm back. It was less than a second. <laughs> it was uh, less than a second. You should be the only stream under the exalted category is a very reasonable demand on people who bought your books and are playing your game for an audience. Okay, so Asa, this is the um, this is the lotion that was recommended to me, and it's really good. It's whoop, La Roche Posay Laboratoire Dermatologique. Lipicar Balm AP Plus Intense Repair Moisturizing Cream. So this is the one, and it's really good um, if you have extra dry skin or, yeah, anything like that. So this is, if you have extra dry skin, I recommend this. I just started using it, um, and it's also accepted by the National Exe Eczema Association. So this is this is my this is my lotion recommendation. It's uh, very good. Boom. Lotion recommendation. That's it for me. Um, Anna Geeks. You know, I so here's the thing about the streaming category that I don't really know what to do about, right? Uh, don't trust the NEA. They're flaky. What? Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's the question. There's a tabletop, there's a tabletop category now that exists, but D and D is still the category that everybody streams under. Um, Ice Bunny says, yes, La Roche is good. I use them for my rosacea. You can only get them in pharmacies. Oh, I don't think, I think you can get these in non pharmacies. I think you can get this in, like, this is not a, uh, well, yeah, I think you can get this, I, I think in the U.S. you can get this in just regular drugstores. Um, I'm pretty sure. Well, I don't know if you can get them anywhere, but uh, that's my recommendation. Lessa, that is my, that is my recommendation. Right? It's a good one. And I just, I just picked it up and I was like, okay, a friend of mine recommended it to, recommended it to me. Um, so what do we what do we do about this? Because and he, and Anna Geeks uh, has a lot of insight into this that discoverability isn't as good on the, under the tabletop RPG category. I believe yes, this is they really need to, yeah they really need to nuke the D and D category. But I have a feeling Twitch is getting paid to keep it. Yeah, yeah. You should try Dream Cream from Lush. It's the only thing that doesn't trigger my eczema. Oh, is it good? Um, yeah, there's nothing to be done for now. Twitch needs to remove D&D. Yeah, yeah. Dream Cream, I'll check that out. Hey, pen, work. Come on, pen, I'll use this pencil. Dream Cream by Lush, I will look into it. I doubt they're being paid directly at any rate, but they're definitely being pressured. Yeah. Oh, sweet. I will check it out. I will check out Dream Cream uh, by Lush. They're probably influenced heavily by Crit Roll's viewership too, I'd imagine. Yeah. Although, I mean, I imagine if Crit Roll would switch over to TTRPG, that would probably do something. <laughs> oh no. Uh, Anna Geeks, don't let your ankles be eaten. Don't let your ankles be eaten. Preserve your ankles. I, yeah, I think that it would just be better if... I think that it would be better to make TTRPG the category 
and then have Dungeons and Dragons be a tag, right? Like, and you could have Dungeons and Dragons as a tag, um, and whatever else is a tag. But Crit Roll has the same business promotional relationship. Yeah, yeah. And this is the thing: as long as D and D is its own separate category, TTRPG is going to not work as well, and it doesn't it doesn't make sense to have them both. And I understand that D&D is the big kid on the block, but I just feel like they should probably go with TTRPG as the category and then have the individual games as tags. I think that would probably be best. Yeah, they need better tags for categories. And, it does, and yeah, it just doesn't make sense to have both. <laughs> Levi points out that the big kid in the block doesn't need a whole extra advantage, and that is true. That is really, really true. And so I think right now you have people, some people are streaming under TTRPG, but some people are just still streaming under D&D, &D. and I think it's really rough. I think it's hard because you have to decide what what is going to be better for me, and I, I don't know. I think it's, yeah. It's unfortunate because there are a lot of really good and I think what's tricky is that when you're running under D and D as a category, I mean how many times have you seen have you been on a stream that is running under D and D and people show up and they're like, This isn't D and D. What kind of D and D is this? And you're like, It's vampire or it's what you know, whatever the thing is. With DD having been in the category for years already, it doesn't help. This is true. This is true. And of course, it's also part of the larger problem, right? Where in Dungeons and Dragons. <sighs> Hello, my friends. Uh, tell me, tell me you've had this like, have you had this conversation before? Good society. I know I have. Um, I think they should do that with, with everything, really. Three categories: video games, tabletop games, and creative. Everything below that should be tags. Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. That's interesting, Jer. Um, hmm. Hmm. I was talking to somebody yesterday about RPGs, and I said I wanted to get a group to play a system other than D&D. <laughs> what do you mean? <sighs> right. So, like, you know that there's... A, she had played D&D but didn't know other RPGs that even existed. Yeah. See what I'm saying? It's the... It's... You know, Levi... Uh, I'm not convinced Twitch knows anything but video games happens on their surface still. Mm, well, they have to know about Critical Role, right? Although, even though Critical Role gets good numbers, I think they don't get as good numbers as like some Fortnite streamer who gets like a gazillion people. But we all know the problem, right? When you when you tell people what your hobby is, you say, oh, you know, I play D&D, &D, even if that's not what you're playing, because people who are outside of the hobby don't know anything other than D and D, so you end up using the word D and D as a generic for RPGs in general, right? I showed her my other systems. I never get to play. Oh, I hope you get to play some of these other systems, Levi. I hope so. They're convinced that all the money is in competitive stuff, so it becomes self fulfilling. Mm. Do they? CR is the biggest numbers for TTRPG, but they're not the biggest streamers anymore. Oh, but I, I don't think. I don't think they've ever been the biggest streamers, right? I mean, you all can correct me. I mean, I don't hang out on those channels. Um, yeah, D and D is the clean is the Kleenex, Kleenex or Xerox, exactly. So I don't hang out on those channels. But I I was told that Band Aid. Oh yeah, I played a couple online, but always one shots or short campaigns. It scratches the itch. Mm, I'm gonna come back to this thought, Levi. But please tell me, don't don't people who are like super huge, who are GNS was the at one point the most subscribed channel on Twitch. Oh, that's interesting. So now tell me though, Krellen or someone who knows these things, don't the competitive uh, video game streamers like the big Fortnite people, the the who's the what's it's the big people, don't they get like a million views or is that just not true? Is that not true? I mean, I just thought that they got like super crazy numbers. No, I because mm, I. Mm, Yep, before the rise of Battle Royale games. Huh. So, okay, so not that high. So, like, how high do, like, the big, the big streamers get? Like, what are their numbers? Like, 100, 200, 300,000 people? 
Highest I think has been a half a million concurrence, but I could be wrong. Okay, Ninja got paid a million to stream something, but he doesn't have a million subs or anything. Hmm, 100k is normal for the big streamers, concurrent views. Okay, okay. 100,000 is a lot, but Critic Role did beat them. That's true. And what are they at normally nowadays? They, they, I think they normally hit 50,000, right? I feel like they're like averaging 50,000 as, as far as I can tell at the moment. But 500, 100k, also, I don't even know what a chat room would be like for 100k people. What even would that be? I feel like it wouldn't even be a chat room. I don't even know. Oh, I can't even imagine trying to be a mod for that business. 53, yeah, so they seem to be in their 53. Yeah, but that just seems really, it does not seem like it would be a fun, most of the big streamers stream seven days a week. Mm. Yeah, new season of CR capped around 100K, but these days it's around 50K. <laughs> that, that, what's that guy's face? The Kappa's everywhere. Mm. Yeah, any chat in a room with more than 10K just isn't fun. I also just, and Anna, you've modded for GNS. So you, I can't, when I think about the fact that you've modded for GNS, I am in awe of your skills because uh, that just seems like madness, right? That just seems like it would be, it would, it would be insane. I can't. Especially since you were modding during uh, the first campaign when everyone was just like, we hate Marisha all the time. I couldn't, I couldn't, like, I just stopped watching uh, CR chat because that was not interesting to me. Uh, but I just, ooh, you get used to the scroll. I can't even imagine, I can't even imagine what that would be like. That would be, that would be intense. I don't, uh... I think, I mean, it's interesting to me because there are a number of, shows yeah that's there are stories to tell says anna geeks there are stories to tell mm. yeah so um i try to do dry runs character creation dry runs in the process of world building and i'll probably maybe i can share some of the stuff that i'm i'm working on when i put the fate stuff together but trying to get a sense of how that game works and Call of Cthulhu, and I, you know, and I actually do read through the entire book, unless they're like lists of a, like lists of um, advantages or disadvantages, and I'll skim through those. But I do try to make sure I read through everything at least once, and then I'll spot read from there. Unless I'm a player, if I'm a player, then I just read the things that I need to read if I don't have a lot of time. Um, yeah, that's that's yeah yeah that's what I normally do. Um, it's funny because I think a lot about. When you're reading a lot of books, then you start thinking about the organization of those game books and how poorly organized a lot of them are. Mm. I sometimes run a game with just one other person to see the rules. Yes, Levi has helped me with this before. Not really a full game, but just a test. Yeah, I love a good test. If I can get, like, I will do that. I will usually do a dry run by myself. And then if I can get somebody else to, to sort of jump in, I'll say, hey, let me just give you a character. Let's just sort of run through, you know, not, not, yeah, not really a full game, but just some scenarios, right? You know, you're, you're, <laughs> Levi's like, I, I break all this shit really good because I want to see like, what, what are you imagining doing? How does it, how does it go? Doing that really helps me clarify what I don't know about the rules or what, what things about the rules are strange before I get into a real campaign and, and things that I might need to know about how to structure a campaign because the rules do impact a lot of how a game is going to play out we were talking about this a little bit last time but you know if you're so scum and villainy you have to try to roll sixes fours and fives are not great but they're they're okay and the more dice you have, the better chance you are to roll a six. And you can get up to a max of three dice. Uh, but you're limited to two as a starting character. But they have a whole section about how to get extra dice from your companions. 
Uh, Levi went to school for software engineering. Testing edge cases and unexpected inputs are pretty important. Yes. A lot of rules can make a game slow down too, and pacing becomes important if you're trying to achieve goals during a session. So you do need to know like how long, I mean, I think about, oh my goodness, I think about pacing a lot. And so for me, I really want to be as conversant as possible with the rules so that my lack of rules knowledge does not slow things down, right? Like I want to, I, I don't want to be the cause for any slowdowns as a GM. I want to be able, and I want to be able to know the rules well enough that I can help the players move quickly if they, like if the players don't know. Um, you need sixes. Well, so the thing is, um, you cap at three dice for your skill, but you can get other, you can get more dice. So, and this is interesting, we're talking about how mechanics impact what you do you can get um you can get dice by helping people so your your um your fellow players can aid you and that will get you an extra dice so these things you can do to get more dice than just the three but your skill is capped your skill is capped at three and i think you can get another three through different kinds of um means like helping another person pressing your luck like they're the, so you can actually, I think, get up to six dice? Uh, Thuner, Thuner says, as a GM, I just make shit up in the moment and look it up after. That will also happen. Like, sometimes you have to look something up. It's like, if it's really, really important. But oftentimes you can just, like, you know, roll and shout. Um, yeah, four or five is equivalent to a partial success. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> when in doubt, roll and shout. Uh, which... We'll do it. So, but I, and I think that for me, I like to know the pacing of a game. I like to know when I'm when I'm fluid with the rules. How fast does combat go? Um, what are the things I can do to make combat go faster or longer? If I've got a three-hour session, is combat going to take up two hours? I kind of need to know that. Like, is this a system where combat lasts a long time? Is this a system where um, inventory takes a long time? Is this a system where social things take a long time. I kind of just need to know where the rules... And I don't think of it as slowing down. I think of it as zooming in, right? When I think about um, an RPG, I think an RPG system either will will sort of zoom in on certain activities and then zoom out on others. And D&D, for example, zooms in on combat, so it's going to take more time. Uh, 4E especially would zoom in on combat and like let it breathe and give more time to it so it would just take up more space um whereas when i was running night witches with my particular cast um the the on base stuff that was the thing that was zoomed in on the in the rule system the flying the missions took less time that wasn't like sometimes the things happen but like the big zoom in was on those things so you just kind of i want to know generally speaking like where where does the game zoom in put its emphasis that's another sign I think Mercer's a gamist GM. His default when he doesn't know seems to be, fuck it, roll and let's find out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. And I think I think um and I think knowing what your individual game system zooms in on becomes important. And it's not always combat, it's often combat because of the of the roots of the genre, but it is not always combat. There are games that don't have any combat at all and where where do they zoom in what becomes um is this a system where the G dm makes you keep track of cross crossbow bolts or not exactly because that becomes a moment and i'm gonna just for the record i am not bothered by keeping track of crossbow bolts i just think that's something hey steph the bard how are you see bluebeard i have to redo it right now i've got an ombre my uh Hi, Steph the Bard. Uh, at the moment, I'm doing the Beard Ombre, but I need to just re -dye it, is what I need to do. This can also be a simulation reaction. Roll the dice, yeah. Um, I think that with the simulationist, you would approach the die roll differently. Um, hello, Steph the Bard. Hey, Logic Core. How are you doing? Thank you. Steph the, if you all don't know Steph the Bard, Steph the Bard is awesome. Steph the Bard um, was, we played Sunday Fun Day together over in Little Red Dot Space. And uh, Steph the Bard was awesome. And uh, I, I recommend, hey Steph, do you stream? <sighs> Somebody's watching me. And I have no privacy, whoa, I always feel that somebody's watching me. 
Tell me, is it just a dream? Uh, you can almost hear just a little bit of the next uh, verse. I cut it off just a little bit too late. Experience points. Yes. Oh, well then, hold on. Let me do this then. And also, hello, Logic Core. Streamer Steph the Bard. Boom. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Steph, we have almost the same name, which makes us almost twins, which makes us almost the same person. So, you know. Hey, uh, Steph the Bard, how do you like Starfinder? Um, by the way, it is just a dream. You're a brain in a jar dreaming all of this. Hmm. Hmm. I think that's true. Um, so we were talking about um, rule systems and where they where they sort of um, zoom in, where they... Because I don't want to say slow down. I don't like that. I want to say where they zoom in, where they place emphasis. So not having played Starfinder, but having played D&D... Uh, oh, yes. Triplets. Yes. Yes. Triplets. I'm currently playing a plant being. How would you compare Starfinder to Pathfinder to D&D 3.5? I've always heard uh, Pathfinder described as D&D 3.75, right? So still using the OSR, um, plant people. Ah! Uh, so how would you, how would you compare Starfinder to Pathfinder? Oh, yeah, so P Pathfinder was based off of D&D 3.5. Oh, <laughs> the monkey sounds so adorable. Hmm. So, Steph, this is what happened, if you don't know. Uh, but from what Mew tells me, it's Pathfinder in space. Like how the cipher system concentrates on discovery. Yes, that's exactly right, Logic Core. And some games want to spend more time on some things and other things. And it's good for me as a GM to have a sense of what that is before I start running a game so I know, so I can sort of figure out pacing, right? So I can figure out, oh, um, in this game, the emphasis is going to be here. Like this is where the time is going to be spent more often than not. So I should... So, oh, if they're going to start discovering things, I, that's going to, I need more time for that. Um, oh, oh no, my end froze. Okay, refresh. D oh, this is what I want to know. D20s and skill ranks. Yes. Did you hear that? Weirdness. Uh, once Steph the Bard refreshes, we'll ask that question. She will probably have to re redo it. Um, and it's funny because I think a lot of games really do spend time on combat as a default because history of the genre. Um, okay. But if you look at something like the Song of Ice and Fire RPG, they clearly spend ceiling... Ceiling Cat is watching me. But what about Basement Cat? Um, <laughs> Basement Cat and Ceiling Cat both watching me. I always feel that somebody's watching me. Tell me, is it just a dream? Um, The bonus and spell damage get gross. Mm. Um, is it magic in in Starfinder or is it psionics or is it is it um how sci-fi is it like space fantasy or is it like fantasy in space or is it super sci-fi? I'm starting in on Bo Five R Fifth Ed this Sunday. Looking forward to it. Um, five Rings, Legend of the Five Rings. There's a spell called Mind Thrust that has like 5d10 damage at level 3. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, hey, do you know what somebody just told me? That D&D 4th Edition was much more, much more, um, um, the characters were much more resilient. That you started off with like 30, 40 hit points. Let's, I was like, B-O-5-R. Hello, 5-R. <laughs> no worries. You know, I know a lot of people who love Legend of the Five Rings. That was John Wick. Uh, he... And I think that that has a lot of sort of issues with um, with loyalty, right? Um, honor. I think that becomes a thing that's important to that particular game. Teens of hit points in 4E. Okay. Hmm. Which, you know, it's fine. Um, but it's interesting. It's interesting where, where emphasis goes. I was thinking about good society and... You think, okay, you've got these scenes, but then like they've got these different phases 
where do you spend your time in these spaces? They have mystics, technomancers, and solarians. Mystics are mages. Technomancers, oh, are these all magic users of some sort? Sorry, I actually read uh, Musashi's Book of Five Rings before I knew it was a game. So that always comes up first in my brain. You know what? That is fine. I honor it. I honor it. Uh, that is, the, you know, cheers to you. I'm going to have my cream soda. Mm. No, I'm done with my cream soda. That was so sad. There's a new class being play tested called a Witch Warper. One of my party members in our new season is playing one. Mm. So this, I mean... Steph, did you did you play or maybe high mid high twenties actually? Oh right, so first of all, Paladins get fifteen plus con score, which could put them in the low thirties. Right, if their con is like seventeen, that would put them at thirty two. Oh, so Larians are Pathfinders or, or Paladins? Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't... Uh, Steph, when did you start playing? And what was your first game? I want to... I want to... Uh, or, yeah, I want to I wanna place you in historical context. <laughs> Steph, I need historical context for you. Uh, oh, but charisma-based. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. That makes sense. It'll be a year in October. Oh, cool. Awesome. That's a, that's great. No, because you get the con bonus, which maxes out at Cargen. So, oh, whatever, noob, whatever. So then I should tell you stuff. So here's a history thing. So because I like I like the history of gaming. So D and D, from the beginning to its con score. Oh, um, it was. Um, from the beginning of D and D of the history of RPGs to recently, Dungeons and Dragons was always number one. If you look at the sales, um, uh, sales for RPGs, they were always number one by a lot, right? If you looked at the, they had like ninety percent of the market, eighty whatever, and all the other games sort of shared the rest of it. So they were always the big big dog. Um, oh yeah, I'm I'm an old historian. Oh yeah, and so right. So you have this history, 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 and D and D comes out with three three point oh, and then like a year, two years later, they do um, three five, and then Dungeons and Dragons. So and the thing about Dungeons and Dragons third edition was they did this big, huge change, which was like this big deal where they opened up. They did the OGL, the Open Gaming License, where they said basically anybody can use our core mechanics. Uh, to make D and D modules, whatever you want to do. So that was like a big new thing where anybody could make D and D products at this point in time. And this was like this big, um, sort of like it was like a big deal actually. That was like a big huge deal what they did. And Piazo was a company that was making D and D third edition products. And then Dungeons and Dragons comes out to the fourth edition, and the fourth edition is very very controversial. Many people didn't like it. People got upset. There was like it was there was like a big hullabaloo, and what happened was that Paizo, rather than doing fourth edition stuff, basically made Pathfinder, which was which was based on D and D three third editions, open gaming license. They just um, uh, they just sort of modified it a little bit, and oh that's right, they published Dra Dungeon and Dragon magazine too. That is right. Oh that's right, they did Dragon magazine. And so for a couple of years, as Krellen pointed out, Pathfinder beat D Dungeons and Dragons for a couple of years in terms of sales. Um, and um, really, I, I thought they'd done. I thought they'd done something. Yeah. So Pathfinder overtook uh, Dungeons and Dragons in the number one slot during the fourth edition era uh, for a little bit, and then fifth edition came out, and then Dungeons and Dragons hit, took the number one spot again. Uh, but that's sort of like the history of that moment. Um, so that I think that's pretty interesting. So Pathfinder is basically a modification of Dungeons and Dragons third edition. I don't know what's happening with Pathfinder second edition. Like I don't know how. Oh, it's similar to Five E. Interesting. Like because I wonder. I wonder how 
like I wonder how much third edition is still in Pathfinder 2.0 or if they've really moved to fifth edition. A lot of the magazine adventures were Paizo writers or employees. Oh. Um, they launched Pathfinder as a way to avoid having to give us all give all us dragon subscribers refunds when wizards took dragon away from them since they went digital before E. Ooh. Yeah, I'm going to I mean I think they're I know they're doing um the Advent Pathfinder Adventure Card Game Second Edition over at uh, Gen Con. I don't know what else is happening. Um, I love weird off the wall RPGs with cool systems. Um, I like it when the systems are interesting and also work. Sometimes they don't, um, you know. But we'll see. The Rise of the Rune Lord Adventure Path was what I got in lieu of my last. Oh, oh, that's interesting. Huh. Huh. That's very interesting, Krellen. Hmm. The sneak peek of Pathfinder 2 I've seen does not remind me much of 5e. So here's the thing about that, Krellen, and I'm just... I had gotten the impression that it would not... I think so. I'm so bitter I won't be there for Industry Day since the producer of my pod has forged a relationship. Oh. Hmm. I will be there on Wednesday, but I'm not an industry person, so no one I don't get I don't think I get to hang out on industry day. Um so Krellen, about what you're saying, I would be surprised personally. A little surprised. Not I mean I wouldn't die or anything, right? But I'd be a little surprised if Pathfinder 2.0 were really were really that close to 5e. Because I think at this point they've got a bit of a niche, right? They've got a They've got a bit of a niche, which is a slightly crunchier thing, and I, I could imagine them wanting to stick with it. Uh, sorry off topic, but Trooper, do I see some Deadlands and Weird w Weird West books back and to my left? Probably, yes. Where are they? Deadlands! Um... The answer is probably yes, but the question is, so those over there are Castle Falkenstein books. Um, I, I have, I'm pretty sure I have GURPS Deadlands. Mm, 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 mm. There are a lot of folks that I think will stick with PF1. Oh. Huh. People like them with their math binder. I think PF third shelf down under the stack. Oh, um. Somebody's watching me and I have no privacy. Whoa, I always feel that somebody's watching me. Tell me, is it just a dream? Anarch Dovey, Anarch Dovey, Anarch Dovey, Anarch Dovey. Thank you for the follow. Um, orange. Oh, there. Right. You're talking here. Yes. Yes, indeed. So sorry. Yes. 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 Ghost dancers and martial law. Uh, thank you, Logic Core. Look, Logic Core. Here's the thing. Don't judge me. You can judge me. I'm judging myself. Um, I. I'm in a tricky situation where I need to. I'm gonna put this here. I need to organize. Uh, uh, squirrel. I, I need to organize my bookshelves, but there's a problem. One of them is that I can't really lift anything because um, my wrist is not great. But the thing is that this shelf is a little bit too narrow for RPG books. It needs to be. Um, it needs to be a little bit wider for all these RPG books I have. So if I'm going to put RPG books on this shelf, I need this shelf to be a little bit taller. The shelf below it should not be shorter because then I don't think I can actually put I could probably only put paperbacks on there and I want a little like I want a little bit of space. So what I think I need to do is uh move this shelf further up, then move all of these books off this shelf 
so I can move this shelf further up. So then I can move all of these books off the shelf so I can move this shelf further up so then I can put all those RPG books up. So, uh, and they are one piece across the whole way. The shelf, it's, they're all one piece across. That is exactly right. One piece. So, right. Uh, oh, it's something stupid. I have a theory, but you know, people are not paying attention to me at all. Um, it'll be interesting to see how some of these other big companies do. Pathfinder 2, New Savage Worlds. I think some other companies with new versions like Shadowrun. Oh, and actually it's funny, Baron Tor, because there are a lot of companies um, that are coming out with new books, right? I mean, Over the Edge came out with a new edition. Um, Unknown Armies came out with a new edition. Shadowrun had a new edition. Um, I mean, it's like we're kind of in a moment of new editions right now. Uh, TTRPGs are in a weird place. Critical Role and other things like that have caused a huge D&D &D resurgence. I think it's more popular than it's ever been, and I think that's really true. Logic Horse says, Deadlands was the first game I ever got to keep running for a good while, one of the coolest systems ever. Uh, Th Thunair says, it sounds like work, don't do it. So here's the problem, Thunair. When it's not done, I keep thinking about how my... Because my I almost always alphabetize my RPG books by system. So that if Logic Horse said, hey, is that Deadlands? I'd be like, Deadlands? Well, I start with the A. They're my Ds. Yes, they're my Deadlands right over there. And so I just really want to get my books organized. That makes me crazy that they're not. Uh, yeah, well, Shadowrun has a new edition at Gen Con already uh, this year, I guess. Lots of folks surprised, I guess, since the last edition. Yeah, I have to tell you, I, um, I have these. Here are my mixed feelings. I understand that a new edition will make a company money right you make a new edition you make money but i do not like it when additions come too quickly that's all like for me like the 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 shift between dungeons and dragons 3.0 and 3.5 was like two years maybe and that's a a long that's not a long time that's I kind of just, I like my additions to last longer, like 10 years. Give me a good 10 years. I want 10 years on my addition. Uh, yeah. Give me, give me 10 years on an addition before I have to rebuy everything again. And also when you come out with a new addition, also create a, um, a conversion guide. Uh, you know, the thing about CFC is so funny because they've had seven, yeah, I think 10 years is good, right? The real problem with Shadowrun is that they released the last Splat book to give Techmancers all their rules, and like the next month they announced an edition. Yeah, see, that's really frustrating. Yeah. I'm playing catch up with D&D. There's like three modules I want to play. Not everyone can be GURPS. No, not everyone can be GURPS. But still, come on, you know, just give me, give me a little time. Oh, and Thunair, you were talking about um, the Schwarze Auge, right? Having, having the number one slot in Germany. And I got to play, because, you know, they did a, an English translation of the Schwarze Auge, um, The Darkest Eye. And I played it at Gen Con last year, and that was a fiddly system. My goodness, um, it was... Um, it was, it, it was a crunchy system and I don't know if the crunchiness, I don't know how much it added to the experience is what I wanted to say. Um, and I think it's because there are things that were not that intuitive like i think you can be crunchy but intuitive and then you can like you can be crunchy and ele elegant oh it, it does depend on the it does depend on the on the changes to uh anarchy that's true that is true if if they're so totally radical then sometimes there's just nothing you can do about it um i've got a crpg on gog that good old games that uses the german system and i can't even figure out how to make a character in it um so I think you can be crunchy and elegant or crunchy and less intuitive. And if I remember with the Schwarze Auge, it's like 3D20. So you, you like assemble 3D20 for your roles. But um, they're 
based on your skills and attributes. So like if you want to do a history check, then you pull in a, a die that's based on your intelligence, a die that's based on your history, and maybe a die that's based on your intuition, right? But then like even but then I think you can repeat something. So I think like initiative is like speed, speed, and then also perception or something like this. And so you you sort of assemble three dice based on what your skills are and each die has a target number which is and here's the thing it's not just it's you're not just pulling in a die pool um the thing that you're pulling from is a target number so like you have to roll i don't know lower than your stat maybe and you roll all three d20s and you count how many times you roll under the stat for that particular die so did you roll under like your dex for that for like if you're doing like dex history and sneakiness for this one roll to do a thing you have you say okay well i rolled under my dex so that's one success uh i rolled under my sneakiness so that's two successes but i didn't roll under my history so i only have two successes like it's just like uh it is it is a and i like myself some crunch it just was not um uh, it is not intuitive, is what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> it is not an intuitive system. Oh yeah, the D the Modifius two D twenty sounds pretty cool. But I was it just you know because the thing is I don't mind um, I don't mind crunch. I just want it to make sense and be intuitive so that you just you can intuit what's happening. Like I don't mind if there are a lot of things to to track. I just want them to make sense. That's all. Yeah, too much to remember can be a little bit oppressive. And you're like I don't. Mm, uh, um, oh, you play smaller systems. Yes, yes. Thunair, smaller systems are awesome. I like a good smaller system. Let me see. The homebrew game that I built and ran at Momocon was a blast. I want to know more about Momocon. I want to know more about it. It's how I learned about Nerdburger Publishing and found Capers and Die Laughing. So the system, well, see, the thing is, Steph the Bard, not all people are narrativist. Some people don't want the system out of the way. Um, I like system. Like, I mean, I can do a rules light system where there's no system and it's like, it's barely there. Although sometimes that can be a problem. But I, I don't mind if it's crunchy. I just want the system, like, I don't mind if there are a lot of systems. Like, I really don't. Sometimes it's like, but it has to be, the systems have to be good do you know what i mean i think um like some people really want a good system for combat and that becomes the thing that they're really interested in or social trickery you know or maneuvering or um land management or domain management like they're the, you know sometimes the system is part of the game and it is part of the narrative and and that's important it's just if it's not done well then it's awkward right so like okay so let me put it this way i have no pro i first off i have no problem playing a game with no combat whatsoever it's fine i also have no problem playing a game with combat but if you do have combat i want the combat system to work well right like i don't want it to be bad <laughs> i know that sounds really simple um however as much as i like D, &D uh as much uh, as much I like D&D system, but not a fan of the 20 plus modifier. Mm -hmm. It makes characters that are supposed to be competent end up fools sometimes. And Arc W, what you 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 are you are singing my song. I do not like flat probability curves. Don't like it. It's too swingy. Makes me unhappy. I've got a homebrew idea that I'm hunting for a system, and I'm having to roll find it the right fit. What are you looking for, Steph the Bard? Tell us, tell us the vibe you're going for, because maybe we can give you some suggestions. I know lots of different systems, and I am my, my the thing that I love more than anything is trying to recommend systems for getting people's vibe. For classic fantasy, I like Arcane Codex for all its flaws because it's reasonable, crunchy, and has a great class lens of character, character creation. Mm -hmm. So it's more about the variable nature of the dice in that case. Yeah, I, I am. I can, hey, Barator, I'm not just three d six. I can do four d six. Oh, bell curves are dice pools. I mean, for me, I just want 
It's in... Mm. I'm really enjoying Cthulhu Confidential for ease of play. Yeah, right? So Cthulhu Confidential has got nice ease of play, but I find that the rules that they do have work... Hey, Sir Saiyan, work to help make... They add to this... Like, the system adds to the experience, right? I think that the... Um, the rules themselves help help that experience, right? So you have some things that you have to manage. My wife just raspberry at the TV because you said that, Trooper. She dislikes 3D sex we're under so much. Does she like high numbers? Is that is that why? Tell me. Because some people like high numbers. Uh, Storyteller seems to be my go-to. Dice pulls for the win. I just want... Um, this is what I want. And this is probably because I I trend simulationist. But if a character is supposed to be good at something, I want them to be good at that thing. I want a player to have a reasonable sense of their odds of being successful at that thing. Bell curves and dice pools also have the benefit that dice are fun to roll and it lets you roll more dice. Uh, yes, but also, uh, she likes roll high systems too much akin to Yahtzee with D6s, she says. Uh, some people like roll high. Some people like roll low. It does happen. Um, if you could do a bell curve roll high, that would be fine. Um, fate is sort of roll high. It's 40, 46, 40 fudge, right? But so, I mean, I was thinking about, let's say I make a character and my character is supposed to be really good at stealth and i'm in a 3d6 system let's say roll low and i've got a 15. i know that if i have a 15 i am going to succeed like 80 something percent of the time maybe 90 percent of the time like i'm going to be very like and so i know that i'm good at this and i'm when i roll most of the time i'm going to be successful i also know that if somebody says to me oh hey it's a really slippery thing that you're sneaking around in, um, and I know that's going to bring my numbers down. I can I have a reasonable sense of how I'm going to do in that role, so I can judge my abilities as a player, and then as a GM, I can also judge the abilities with with a, with a one with a one die system. Mm, you don't know, right? Like I'm the best sneaker, but I just you know I have a yeah, I could just roll really. You know what I mean? Like you have a much better chance of rolling. It's just too swingy. Ah, the realms of Arcania, based on the Schwarze Auge. Um, it's a horror story, but the idea would be very focused on the PCs. All the PCs are inherently magical, so I want the combat system to have some crunch. Like, I want limits, not just, I'm going to blast this thing. And if they crit, I don't want to feel forced into letting them just one-shot the enemy. Mm hmm. I say forget dice altogether. Instead, you put a chicken between the player and the G DM, and whoever can get the chicken to come to them wins the challenge. You get corn if you have advantage. I like it. So you want okay. So so you want a little bit of crunchy combat. You want magic. Um, you don't want crits one shotting the enemy. Uh, Steph the Bard, tell me more. Do you want um, Mage 20? Steph wants Shadowrun. Uh, do you want classless or do you want classes? Are you open to there being no classes? Um, are you open to there being no levels? Do you want it gritty or do you want it cinematic? Steph, gritty or cinematic? Give it, give, tell me about uh, power levels. And is everybody a mage? This is the next question. Is Oh, all the PCs are magical. Mm -hmm. You prefer classless. Mm -hmm. Gritty or cinematic? Cinematic. Mm -hmm. So you want classless, cinematic, everybody's a mage. High power, low power. High power, but maybe not, but not critting. Mm. I think so I think ours magic is probably out because it's probably not cinematic enough um, mid power oh mages are magical beings you know you might 
you might want to look at Mage 20, right? So that's um, Mage 20 is the is White Wolf. It's the same system as Vampire the Masquerade, um, and there are different types of magic users. So everybody's a mage in that one. Everybody's a mage in Ars Magica, but that's sort of like a gritty medieval medieval fantasy, sort of very Arthurian in certain ways. Uh, mage is set in the modern day, and it has a bit of a um, What's the word? Um, a bit of a improvisatory magic system, so you can kind of you can sort of shape your own spells. That could be interesting, and there's some checks and balances there. Uh, start saying, start saying. I suppose they're more sorcerers to use D and D. Yes, you might want to check out Mage 20. You might want to check out Mage the Ascension, 20th edition, 20th anniversary edition. That was a good call, whoever put that out there. I think that's a, that could be interesting. Um, what else might be interesting? Hmm. Oh, thanks, Stay Hydratabot. It does, but I feel like you can... Yeah, Mage sounds like a good fit. Mm-hmm. It's a modern day dice pool system, D10s. That's true. That's true. It was designed to I mean it came out the first the first setting was was modern day, but you could um do it, and you can forge your own spells. Um oh, I hope your friend is okay, Logic Core. Um, I love those those wings and hearts. We're talking about a good system. So with um with mage there aren't classes, but there are clans right so you sort of pick a a tradition that you're a part of and then you, you create your character uh, that way and yeah yeah i think i think you should maybe check out mage the ascension the 20th edition rules i think that might be interesting for you um there's there are checks and balances on mages they can't just go wild and sling fireballs in public uh because that would get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. But if that's what, you know, I think stuff, look into Mage, Mage the Ascension, 20th anniversary edition. Being Mage 20 in Dark Ages life is way easier because the paradox is not as bad as the modern day. Yeah, so part of the, the like, you know, because each of these, the, the World of Darkness systems all had some kind of um, stinger. I do kind of lean towards taking your time with spells, blasting takes some prep. It does, which I think is also interesting. Um, so the thing about World of Darkness, which is interesting, this is where mechanics become important again, is that they had a mechanic, each different one had some kind of a mechanic that you had to struggle with um, as a player. So in Vampire, you struggled with humanity, right? That you have a humanity score and the more you do terrible things the more you lose your humanity and once you lose it if you lose too much of it then your character is no longer a pc anymore so it becomes about this tension right this internal tension between the monster you are and the human you once were so uh, that is like the thematic mechanical tension in in uh in vampire and that means mechanically that that becomes something that's important in the game is this struggle in um werewolf it was corruption right taint corruption taint yes corruption is that what they called it i never played i i had werewolves in campaigns i was in but i didn't play werewolf taint corruption the worm the worm what is the rage what is what no uh What's the not, what is their what is their thing? Krellin, what's their thing? What is it? It's a uh, They didn't? They didn't have the they didn't have their uh version of um humanity because I think Mage had paradox. Huh. They didn't have a thing. It's their weapon and their curse. Mhm. Mm I suppose that's the closest thing I'm thinking of, right? Something that gives you... Sounds like I may have to get past my citation supporting White Wolf after the recent scandals and check out Mage. Um, 
werewolf circles that they were dying and losing. Well, if it helps you at all, this is old, uh, old white wolf. Um, I've not played uh, werewolf. The other one. My favorite wrote that I ever made was the Fawns Matter. Matter one, correspondence two, forces two. Strike a machine anywhere to activate it. Effect is coincidental as long as you play it off with a thumbs up or an A. Oh, that's good. Um, that's right. So Mage 20 is Onyx Path. Um, so, right? So that's a thing. Um, yeah. Oh, and Wraith, they have Pathos. Um, what else do you have? Hey, what do you have in, um, does Hunter have anything like that? Um, Changeling had something too, right? Oh, what was Changeling's thing? In Aberrant, I forgot what it was called, but there's like a... In Aberrant, there's a a thing that gives you... But the more superpowered you get, the more like the more you're degenerating. There was like a, a rating that also did that in Aberrant, which was their superhero one. Well, I played a really good superhero... I, pl I played a really good campaign of Aberrant. Um... Hunter didn't really have a thing other than living in a world world for a, full of monsters. Ouch. Um, the closest that Werewolf had was Harano, which was basically depression for Gaia. Changing had banality. That's right. Banality. Somebody's watching me, and I have no privacy. Whoa, I always feel that. Somebody's watching me. Tell me, is it just a dream? Hey, uh... Pop, Papa Negro, ah, uh, welcome in, welcome in to this to the foxhole. How are you doing? Uh, pull up a chair, hang out with us. Hunter the system were the super powered hunters. <laughs> the hunters are squish. Yeah, they were super. They were super powered. I may need to add that to my wish list or hope for a good deal at Gen Con. You know, you can probably get the PDF uh, pretty decently from Drive Through RPG is what I'm imagining. Um, because I think, I don't even know if you can get it in hard copy anymore. I think um, I think they did a limited edition hard copy of the 20th anniversary books. And I think nowadays you would get them. Um, oh, hey, hey, follower. Um, wow, we're getting some um, troll follows right now. That's, uh, that's awesome. So, whoever you are that's hanging out. Oh, it does do a print on demand. That's really good. So you can prop, I would go through, um, I would go through drive through RPG stuff. Uh, I think that probably the best, best way for you to go for it. Um, so, if, uh, Hey, Jer, if you're here, would you do me a favor and uh, report, ban, do that business for those folks? It might be just, uh, I don't know if you can, but if you can, that would be great. Maybe you can't. But if you could, uh, that would be awesome. If you can't, we'll, we're just going to ignore them. Um, one of my dreams is to have enough money to throw to throw away to get a uh, high quality color print on demand. Oh, that would be really awesome. That would be amazing. Oh, thank you, Jer. Um, I just feel like those people can be reported. I feel like they can be reported. Thank you, because they don't. They just need a little bit of reporting. Also, I feel like they need therapy. You know, this is. I'm feeling like they need maybe a hug. Uh, maybe some therapy. Oh, 120 bucks. Ooh, ooh, 100, that's a lot. That is a lot. Ooh, yeah. You know, so sad. I think it's, um, I think it's just chatting. I think when you're in the just chatting category, people get, like, trolls show up and get weird. Um, yeah. But Steph, I would say check drive through RPG for the Mage 20 book. It might be the best way to get it. But, you know, um, the storyteller system is pretty intuitive. Um, 
this is a thing that I actually like in an RPG system, um, which is a thing that I enjoy. Now, people say that GURPS is crunchy and blah, 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 all that. But what I like about GURPS is that it's elegant enough that I can improvise. I like a system that I, as a GM, I can improvise if you say, um, oh, no worry, Krellen, we're, we're gonna be going pretty soon. Um, I like a system where if you say, what, what am I doing? What's happening? If somebody, if a player wants to do a random thing that I know as a GM how to sort of spontaneously do that, right? Um, I talk too much, um, and I, and so with 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 the world of darkness, if you want to, let's say, you want to use history to be very to persuade somebody, right? To sort of use your history skill and uh, do like a kind of a public speaking history thing, um, then you're like, okay, let me use persuasion plus history and you roll the dice for persuasion the per roll the dice for history put them together boom if somebody wanted to look up some like to do historical research use your intelligence use your history put them together boom uh if right like so that there's the that's a run dmc song and i think it it, it is oh, run dmc um and so i think if you can um so there's a way in which you can improvise pretty well in the white in the the world of darkness system because it's pretty elegant that way i find grips is pretty elegant to improvise in um the schwarze auge was not was was not elegant to improvise in um yeah so i i just want a system no matter how rules light or rules heavy it is that because there actually there are some rules light -like games that you can't improvise well in because they're not set up that way. So I just want a system where as a GM you can throw things at me that are a little out of the loop and I can pretty easily improvise it and have it still work within the framework. Thank you, Jer. White Wolf Exalted was a lot of fun. First edition was kind of the best though. Uh, third edition apparently has just come out. It looks beautiful. It's this huge sort of massive tome, but I don't know what it plays like yet. I don't know if it's good, but people are enjoying it. So, friends, Romans, countrymen, it's 912. It's time for me to go. This is what we got. I want to I wanna share with you what's happening. So first off, I want to thank you all for being here. I'm Trooper SJP. This is the Academic Foxhole. Thank you for being here. We have, what is going on this week? This week, tomorrow, which is Thursday at 6 p.m., I will be streaming. Uh, tomorrow I'll be streaming Night in the Woods. Oh, it's only print on demand. Oh, that's messed up. You know, print on demand is that's tricky. It makes it easier for the for the game designer, but it makes it harder for the players. Um, so I'll be playing Night in the Woods, the first session of Night in the Woods tomorrow, which is the game that won the Excellence and Narrative category for the IGN Awards. Um, thank you, Sir Saint. Thank you for being here. Friday at two p.m. I'll be doing Ghosts of Salt March, Salt Marsh. Saturday at noon I'll be doing horizon zero dawn and sunday offline i will be probably concluding cthulhu confidential my my offline run through of it with rissa and then i can uh plan to actually do it on my stream uh, i have a discord and you can join me in the discord we're very friendly we are sort of medium traffic uh, i have a twitter you can find me on academic foxhole and also i have a youtube where i archive all of this stuff um, <laughs> until I get distracted. Um, what else? And then next week, on next week on a Wednesday, you will find me here for, you know, the next part of, of Atlanta Nights and more chatting about RPGs and maybe even, uh, maybe even a guest or so. Maybe, you know, we, we'll we see. Um, I'm always the optimist, always the optimist. And I, I think, oh, yeah, sorry, one more thing I wanted to tell you. In 45 minutes on Random Tuesday's channel will be the conclusion of the Celestial Rangers saga. I will be there in chat uh, watching Celestial Rangers and you can hang out uh, with me if you want. Uh, it'll be really nice, it's a good cast and um, it'll be fun, so. Everyone, 
uh, it's going to be a good summer. It's going to be a good summer. We're going to have all of the Atlanta Knights. And uh, just so you know, Chapter 5 has, uh, I think, Bruce Lucent, maybe? No, Stephen Suffern is going to be in there. And I think also Margaret Eastman, the nurse. That's what I'm saying. So that's going to be all of the excitement. I'm going to eat some dinner. And, uh, oh, Steph the Bard, I'm so glad you caught this stream. Wednesdays is going to be reading Atlanta Nights and then um, talking RPGs. That's going to be our life. That's going to be our Wednesday life. It's going to be scandalous. Yeah, yeah. I feel like there's going to be some Stephen Suffern and some Margaret Eastman in Chapter 5. I don't even know. Does he suffer as much as Chat suffered? I don't know. You know, he's really muscular. And he has skin like, uh, like uh, his has muscles that uh, ripple like the waves of the ocean underneath tan skin, like a cinnamon roll, like a cinnamon cake, and uh, <laughs> and and then also Yvonne Perrin has got cheeks as red as a volcano underneath green leaves that are her eyes, and then caterpillars, black caterpillars that are her pupils that are black caterpillars. <laughs> So it's gonna be good, everyone. Um, I'm really excited about our about the rest of June and July and getting as much done as we can. So that's it for me, everybody. I want to thank you all for being here. You all are the best, and I'm gonna figure out how to set up the stream deck, right? And I want to thank all of you who followed me. Not all of you, but you know, many of you who followed me. And I want to thank all the subs and all the bits. I want to thank you all for being here. All of you are uh, are supporting me and helping me. Oh, I'm just wrapping it up, Anna Geeks. Oh, speaking of which, Anna Geeks, I'm going to message you once I get off of the stream. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, right? Oh, it's super easy to set up. Oh, good, because I want to like set up all the different RPG scenes so I can be like, oh, Here's the Cthulhu Confidential one, boop. And then right here's the boop, boop, figure it out. Hey, Hrothgar, um, yes, my beard is blue. Tell your daughter, yes. It's gonna be more blue in uh, a few moments, but uh, Anna Geeks, are you, I'm gonna, um, oh good. If uh, I'm, it's, I'm excited to figure out what I can do with it what all things I can do, because apparently you can do lots of stuff, and I hope I can figure out the ways to be um, most exciting with it. Oh, good. Excellent. I hope it's easy on the Mac, too. They say it's Mac compatible, so I'm excited to figure out, like, just press buttons to do all of the things. Apparently, you can do everything, including open up programs and close programs, and so if that is all true, I'm excited for it. Um... Will the mustache be gold? No, it's also going to be blue. It's going to be all blue. Her follow-up is, if you're using the blue rinse because you're old like her dad. <laughs> um, tell your daughter that neither I nor her dad are old. We're just well-seasoned. Um, <laughs> you know, we're just, we're just, uh, we're like, a, we're, we're aged like a fine wine. That's all. <laughs> Use it. Oh, you can use it as a command console for Elite Dangerous. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna figure this out. And so I want to say all of you, all of your support is uh, salt and peppered. Yes, Barator. That's it. Salt and peppered. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, so all of your support is helping me do this, and it's gonna help me bring some Cthulhu Confidential to the channel. She's lashing her ass off and said, even fine wine turns to vinegar. Hey, hey, hold on a second, though. Who does not want a really nice balsamic vinegar on their salad? Like, even, even vinegar is really good. I'm just saying. Who does not want a good balsamic vinegar? Oh, perfection, my friends. Perfection. So, I'm going to go. I'm going to eat some dinner. Um, thank you all for being here. And uh, I will... I will see you all soon. I will catch you on the flip side, everybody. Um, <laughs> take care, everybody. <laughs> Old people are not food. What? Uh, vinegar pickles makes everything. Yeah, I'm just saying. No soylent, but lots of good, like, vinegar is delicious. Oh, bye, everybody. I'm going to see you maybe during Celestial Rangers, but if not, I will see you tomorrow. Take care, everybody. <laughs> bye. <laughs>
Oh, I've got to press my button. See, if I had the stream up, the stream lab up, the stream, the stream, what do you call it? The stream deck, I could just press a button and then I'd stop streaming, right? But I got to now do this thing where this one. All right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna listen to Run DMC. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to um UB Illin. Dun da 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 da. UB Illin. Da 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 da.